Hi again and welcome back. In this video we'll be learning about the genitive case. The genitive case is another role a nominal can play in a clause. And we've actually learned a lot about this already because although we didn't call it genitive, the possessive pronouns are actually the genitive form of personal pronouns. So the genitive form of the first person personal pronoun, ego, is emu. And the genitive form for the second person is su with omicron upsilon. And for the third person, the genitive form was autu or autes, uh, or in the neuter, autu again. But possession is only one idea that the genitive case can convey. What the genitive case tells us is that the nominal in the genitive case is somehow related to what we call the lead nominal. Let's look at this a little bit closer. The genitive nominal is somehow related to the lead nominal, and possession is just one kind of genitive relationship. So if we take ha pater mu, uh, mu modifies pater and tells us that this is the father related to me somehow. Similarly, autes ha oikos, autes is genitive and it modifies oikos, and that tells us that the house ha oikos is somehow related to her. It's her house. What are the genitive case endings? Well, we've already seen uh, quite a bit of this with the what we called the possessive pronouns. In the uh, second declension, the masculine and neuter endings are the same, and they're just an upsilon. The feminine uh, first declension ending is just a sigma, and the third declension ending uh, for the genitive is Omicron Sigma, os. Now, you need to be careful though, because th this os ending looks just like the nominative case ending for masculine second declension nouns. So it's going to be really important to remember what declension a particular noun is. Uh, because if it's third declension and it ends in os, you know, ah, this is genitive. But if it's second declension and masculine and it ends in os, you'll have to remember that it's nominative. Why did the Greeks have to make the endings overlap like this? I think they were just cruel and unusual. But let's see those endings with the connecting vowels on them so they look a little bit more familiar. And there we see the u in masculine and neuter second declension, as or as in first declension feminine, and then again, since there's no connecting vowel for third declension nouns, just os. Let's take a look at some genitive case examples. The nominative logos becomes logu in the genitive. Adelphe becomes adelphes. Thura becomes thuras. Technon in the neuter second declension becomes technu. In the third declension, we see that the stem changes in uh, most cases uh, before we put the os ending on. And so pater becomes patros. Pais becomes paidos. Ithus becomes ichthuos. And uh, polis becomes poleos and the os ending it gets lengthened to os. We're going to talk in another video about the different patterns of stem change for third declension vowels. The important thing to know at this point is just that the stems do change before you put on the os ending in most cases, and that what's actually happening is we're moving from the nominative singular stem, which is itself irregular, and the stem that we're seeing in the genitive case is the stem that all of the other cases will use. Uh, that's also the stem that we're going to see in plural forms later on. So we call the, the stem that emerges in the genitive case the real stem 
of third declension nouns. And that's why it's often important with third declension nouns to remember not just the nominative case, but also the genitive form, so that you remember that genitive stem, which you're going to use in all of the other forms. The genitive definite article is quite easy. You've got tau, again, plus first or second declension genitive endings. Again, there's no third declension uh, definite article. Third declension nouns just use the uh, first or second declension endings uh, the same way that other nouns do. And so the article will have to agree with the nominal's gender, just as before, um, even if an unusual declension is used. So we're going to see later on that occasionally we'll get a feminine noun that uses second declension endings. But the uh, the definite article will remain feminine. Uh, so we have hehodos, which is uh, a term for road or way. And even though it takes second declension endings, its gender is feminine. So we use he, not ha. And again, in the genitive, we use tes, not to. Um, the feminine definite article also, we need to remember it always uses a, the eta uh, connecting vowel, even if the noun that it's uh, introducing is one of the nouns that uses an alpha connecting vowel. Because remember, in the first declension, we can have either alpha or eta as a connecting vowel, depending on the noun. So even though Marias uses alpha, uh, the definite article uses the eta, tes Marias. The forms then of the genitive definite article are tu, tes, and tu. And again, we see in the masculine and neuter genitive the same ending, u, with the feminine uh, having that sigma ending, uh, tes. Let's compare the case forms then for the cases that we've already learned. In uh, masculine second declension nouns, we have halogos, then the genitive to logu, and the vocative loge. For feminine first declension nouns, we have hea del fe for the nominative, the genitive is tesa del face, and the vocative is just adelfe because remember the vocative and nominative forms are the same for feminine nouns. We see something similar with the neuter second declension nouns. We begin with ta technon. Uh, the genitive is identical to the masculine second declension nouns, tu technu. And then the vocative technon is the same form as the nominative. Third declensions, again, uh, get a little bit more uh, complicated when we're looking at the stem because the stems change. But as far as the endings go, they're fairly simple. We have ha pater. Uh, in the genitive, we get tu. Uh, we're using the second declension definite article, remember. Tu patros, with some stem change and then the os ending. And the vocative, again, we said, is the the stem of the noun by itself, uh, pater. And again, once we learn a little bit more about uh, third declension noun stems and how they change, this form, pater, will make a little bit more sense. Let's think a little bit more about the meaning of the genitive case. Genitive nominals, we said, modify other nominals, usually. Uh, there are a few cases where they'll modify verbs, but uh, generally they modify other nominals. So we have in each case a, a lead nominal, that's the noun being modified or the adjective being modified, and we have a genitive nominal, that's the one in the genitive case. And what the genitive case tells us is that the genitive nominal is somehow related to the lead nominal, but there are a lot of ways the two things might be related. And we can't translate or even really interpret uh, a genitive phrase until we've decided what the relationship must be. So onamamu is a name that's somehow related to me. 
we might translate it my name and think of it as the name that I possess. Um, Pater Marias is a father that's somehow related to Maria. We might translate that Maria's father, but notice it's not the father that Maria owns, possesses, it's the father who um, is the parent of Maria, a father that's genetically related to Maria. Uh, Karpos tudendru is a fruit that's somehow related to the tree. And so we might say a fruit that comes from the tree or a fruit from the tree. Well, that's a different relationship again between the fruit and the tree. So you can see that uh, one approach to the genitive is simply to uh, leave the uh, genitive as one big category and in each case try and infer from context what the relationship is between the genitive nominal and the lead nominal. Textbooks will often encourage you to use of as a default translation and so uh, to dulu hakurios would be the master of the slave and pater marias would be the father of maria and karpos tudendru would be the fruit of the tree um, that is not bad as far as it goes uh, the problem is that the english word of isn't as vague isn't as broad in its use as uh, the genitive case is in Greek. And so if we get used to using of for the genitive, it's going to bias our interpretation down the road. Um, I think a, a better approach, even though it sounds more awkward in English, is to take the genitive word and put it directly in front of the lead nominal in our first initial uh, gloss of the phrase. So uh, to do lu hakurios would be the slave master. We're putting the genitive word slave in front of master. The slave master. Ha pater Marias is the Maria father. Karpos tudendru is a tree fruit. Now, this doesn't make as good English right away, um, but what it does uh, is actually help us to recognize that we have to make a further interpretation of the genitive relationship before we can make a proper uh, a proper translation into English. Uh, I actually see this, this as an advantage of uh, this approach. Um, it doesn't usually uh, leave us with smooth enough English for us to be satisfied, whereas uh, using of can often leave us with a readable English translation, and so we don't dig any deeper, where in fact we need to dig deeper, and the actual relationship in the genitive in a particular case might not be a relationship that is communicated by of in English. After we take a first approach, uh, put the genitive noun in front of the lead noun in English, then we have to make a second proper translation once we've identified the particular relationship behind this genitive. And this again has to be inferred from context. Uh, Hakurios Tudulu is the master who owns the slave. Uh, there's nothing uh, in the genitive there that tells us that the relationship is ownership. But when I look at it and I think initially this is the slave master, then I have to think in context what kind of relationship is there between masters and slaves. And if we were looking at a full passage, we'd have even more context to help us with that. And generally, the relationship between a master and slave is the uh, uh, one of ownership. So to do lu hakurios would mean the master who, who owns the slave. Hapater Marias. Uh, we would initially gloss as the Maria father. And then we might decide that the relationship between Maria and her father is uh, one of uh, family relationship. And how do we express that in English? Well, just with the English possessive. So we might say Maria's father. 
Carpos to Dendru, uh, the uh, tree fruit. Uh, we might decide that the relationship between the tree and the fruit is that the fruit comes from the tree. And so we might translate it properly, a fruit from the tree. So do you see what we did? We started with the initial uh, uh, rough translation where we just put the genitive uh, nominal in front of the lead nominal in our English gloss. Uh, and then we asked, all right, what is the specific relationship in this case that the genitive is indicating between the genitive nominal and the lead nominal? And then we use that specific relationship to make our proper translation. Now, although in the end, we always have to infer the specific kind of relationship from the context of the genitive phrase, we have over the years recognized that there are a, a relatively small number of very common typical uh, relationships, kinds of relationships that genitive phrases involve. And so very often grammars will talk about subcategories of the genitive case. So I'd like to introduce you to eight of those subcategories and uh, it's important to recognize that the, these aren't uh, the only kinds of relationship that the genitive case can uh, denote, but this is a, a start at uh, getting a, a, a list of kinds of relationship that you can run through in your head when you meet a, a genitive phrase to help you remember what all the options are. Um, and then if in a particular instance, none of these kinds of relationships uh, that I go through here, none of them apply to your particular phrase, then that's fine. Uh, the genitive uh, is broad enough to go beyond these categories. But we can say that the majority of instances of the genitive case fall under uh, one of these eight uh, kinds of genitive relationship plus a few more that we'll look at in future videos. The first of these is what we call the genitive of relationship or the genitive of personal relationship. This is where the lead nominal is in a personal relationship with the genitive nominal. And we usually translate this just with an English possessive. So, tes gunes ha'aner, we might uh, first gloss as uh, the woman man and then ask, what's the relationship between the woman and the man? Then we would decide, well, maybe it's marriage. So we would translate it, the woman's husband, since uh, on air can mean husband as well as, as uh, man. Ha pater Marias, the Maria father, we might decide that this is uh, a matter again of a personal relationship. And so we might translate that Maria's father. Hey, to Georgiou Adelphi, we would start off translating that uh, in a rough way as uh, the George sister, and then uh, ask, okay, what kind of relationship is there between George and the sister? And again, it's a family relationship, so we would just translate it as a possessive, George's sister. A possessive genitive translates much the same way. So, tu kuriu hadulos is the master's slave. Ha oikos simonos is Simon's house. But we could always uh, also translate this uh, a little bit more fully. And for hey to Alexandru suke, we could say Alexander's fig tree, but we could also say the fig tree owned by Alexander. Now, just remember. Uh, looking at the genitive of relationship and the possessive genitive here, um, there's nothing about the form of the words that tells us which kind of relationship the genitive is indicating. Uh, we have to infer it, remember, from context. But having some labels like this will help us to remember the kinds of relationship that are possible. The attributive genitive uh, is 
the situation where the lead nominal has the quality expressed by the genitive nominal. And this is where we tend to make the genitive nominal into an adjective. So oinos to hudatos is uh, wine that is somehow related to water. And we might decide that, that uh, it's wine that has the quality of water. And so we might translate it watery wine. The genitive of content. This is where the genitive nominal is the content of the lead nominal. And this is what we're going to translate often with full of or filled with. So oikos to bromatos is a house full of food. And ta to ichthuos skuos is the vessel filled with fish. And to hudatos ge is a land ge full of water, to hudatos. Notice here that the uh, English words full of or filled with are just implied by the genitive uh, case of the genitive nominal. And again, how do we know to uh, add those English words? Well, we have to start off asking what's the relationship between food and a house or between fish and a vessel. And then we remember, ah, the genitive often indicates a relationship of content to container. And so we infer from that that the relationship in this case is one of content. With a genitive of material, the lead noun <clears throat> is made of or consists of the genitive noun. So we can translate this with uh, made of or consisting of. Trophe to lechanu may mean food made of vegetables, to lechanu. To hudatos thalasa uh, can mean a sea consisting of water, to hudatos. The epexegetical genitive, where the lead nominal is the same thing or person as the genitive nominal. This is where we often translate using the English uh, phrase, that is, or sometimes even just surround the genitive nominal with commas. So, gune meteros, the uh, mother woman, uh, the mother and the woman in this case uh, have a very close relationship. They're the same thing. So we might say a woman that is a mother. Similarly, uh, hetrofe to artos, the bread food. We might decide that the relationship between the bread and the food is, uh, again, that they're identical. And so we could say the food, comma, the bread, comma, and then continue with the sentence. With the genitive of source, the lead nominal comes from the gen genitive nominal. And so we often will gloss this with from or that comes from. So anthropos to Corinthos is the Corinth man. What's the relationship between Corinth and the man? Well, probably the, it's the man who comes from Corinth or the man from Corinth. Hey to Dendrusuke, the fig tree. Uh, or sorry, the, the tree fig. Um, what's the relationship between the tree and the fig? Uh, probably the tree fig is the fig that comes from the tree or the fig from the tree. The partitive genitive. This is where the lead nominal is a part or member of the uh, whole or the group represented by the genitive nominal. And we often translate this with phrases like that is part of or who belongs to or sometimes just of. So ha'aner tes Israel is uh, the Israel man, that is the man who belongs to Israel or the man who is a part of Israel. He tu oikos thugater is the daughter house. Uh, what's the relationship between daughter and house? Well, uh, probably it's that the, the daughter is part of the house in the sense of the household. So we might say the daughter of the household 
or the daughter who belongs to the household. Not in the sense now of possession, but in the sense of uh, being a part of the larger whole. Now, I know this has been a lot to absorb at once, and I don't expect you to re remember exactly how all eight uh, common kinds of genitive relationship work. Um, what we'll be doing is reviewing this and practicing it in the Paideia exercises. But here's a nice overview chart of these eight common kinds of genitive relation so that you can uh, sort of fix them in your mind. A genitive of relationship, that is personal relationship, possession, an attributive genitive, genitive of content, genitive of material, an epexegetical genitive, a genitive of source, and a partitive genitive. Uh, once again, this isn't necessarily all going to stick in your mind right away, uh, but that list of eight common kinds of genitive relationship uh, will be something that we're working on in the Paideia exercises, along with the typical uh, helper words that we use when we translate it into English. Sometimes uh, New Testament authors and other Greek authors deliberately make use of the ambiguity in the genitive case. And so if we have a phrase like ha theos yesu, um, the Jesus God, does that mean the God in personal relationship with Jesus? Uh, the God worshipped by Jesus? That's another possible relationship between them. The God represented by Jesus, the God whom Jesus represents, the God who sent Jesus. Uh, you can see some of these relationships go beyond the, the categories that we've just looked at, but they're all possible relationships uh, that could be implied by the genitive connection between Theos, God, and Yesu, Jesus. And in this case, probably a New Testament writer using this phrase would want us to hear several of these different kinds of relationship. And so the author is actually making use of the ambiguity in order to say several things at once. Now, we need to be careful here not to overuse this idea of deliberate ambiguity. Um, in most cases, we want to ask, what is the specific relationship between the genitive noun and the lead noun? Uh, but we want to be aware that in some cases, we don't want to push too far for a, a, a black and white one or the other choice between different kinds of relationships. Sometimes the author has more than one kind of relationship in mind and is uh, capitalizing on how ambiguous the genitive is in order to express that cluster of relationships in a very terse way. The genitive forms of proper names uh, are important to, to notice because most names are declined in Greek just like other nominals are. And so uh, with Stephanos, which is a second declension proper noun, uh, the genitive form, just like with other nouns in the second declension masculine, is Stephanou, and the vocative is Stephane. Georgios becomes in the genitive georgiou and in the vocative georgie. Uh, with first declension feminine nouns, uh, we have foibe, which becomes foibase, and then the vocative foibe. And maria becomes marias in the genitive, and the vocative is maria. We also have, as we've seen already, some third declension uh, proper nouns, names, so yason becomes yasonos in the genitive and then reverts to just the stem yason for the vocative. Similarly, simon becomes in the genitive simonos and in the vocative reverts to just the stem of the noun simon. The interrogative pronoun tis or ti is uh, quite easy. Remember that this is a third declension pronoun. And so where we had two forms, depending on the gender in the nominative, in the genitive, we just have one form for all three genders, tinos. And we've got that same os 
ending. And notice, like with a lot of uh, third declension nouns, the stem has changed a little bit from T to teen. But in all the other forms of, of the interrogative pronoun, we're going to have that same stem, teen. So the genitive is tinos. Um, the genitive interrogative pronoun takes a little bit of time to get used to using. Um, what we're doing when we use it is asking to whom or what the lead nominal is related. So uh, this might be asking by whom is the lead nominal owned? Uh, Tinos hodulos hutos. Whose slave is this? We might translate that. And Tinos is asking whose. Uh, the genitive interrogative pronoun might be asking uh, to whom the lead uh, pronoun, uh, the lead noun is related. Tinos hethugeter haute. Whose daughter is this? Uh, it might be asking from what or whom the lead nominal comes. Uh, like a, a genitive of, of uh, content or, or perhaps a genitive of source. So tinos hakarpos could mean from where tinos does the fruit come. Or tinos dendru hakarpos could, uh, could be asking from what tree tinos dendru does the fruit hakarpos come. Or if it's a genitive of material, we could be asking with what is the lead nominal made? Uh, tinos ha oikos? Out of what is the house made? Uh, tinos karpu oinos? With what fruit is wine made? You can see here again how the genitive case itself with the interrogative pronoun is very, uh, very ambiguous. So what we have to do is recognize, all right, this is a question. It's a question about the lead nominal, and it's about the relationship between something else and the lead nominal. We're asking, uh, what else is it that stands in this relationship with the lead nominal? But we have to decide from context, again, what kind of relationship we're asking about. Are we asking who owns something? Are we asking who's related to something? Are we asking where something comes from? Are we asking uh, what something's made of, etc.? Although word order is generally very fluid in Greek, um, there are some situations in which there are some constraints on word order just for the sake of clarity. It can be ambiguous which nominal a genitive phrase is supposed to modify. And often we just have to infer from context which nominal the genitive phrase goes with. So for example, in the expression ha Christos su kurios, the question is, does su modify Christu that comes before? Uh, sorry, Christos. Or does it modify kurios? that follows. In the one case, we would translate it, the Messiah is your master, if it's modifying kurios. Or in the other case, we would translate it, your Messiah is a master, if we take su to be uh, modifying Christos. So there is a rule of thumb uh, with the placement of genitive phrases. And that is that the genitive phrase usually modifies the closest nominal, either before or after. That means that uh, uh, we wouldn't usually write Hakurios Christos su if what we want to say is your master is the Messiah. Why? Well, su we want to modify Kurios. But it looks here like su should be modifying Christos instead. Why? Because it's closer to Christos than it is to Kurios. Christos is coming between Kurios and Su. So the default assumption is that Su is modifying Christos. Much better, then, would be any of these three word orders. We could say Su ha Kurios Christos, and then uh, Kurios comes between Su and Christos, and it's the natural choice to be modified by Su. 
Or we could say Hasu Kurios Christos, and that makes it very clear that the genitive is modifying Kurios because it's coming between the definite article and its noun. So it must be modifying that noun. We can even accept Hakurios su Christos, because although we saw before that it's uh, ambiguous, it doesn't actually, uh, it's not actually misleading. It doesn't actually suggest uh, the wrong connection for su. Um, so it's ambiguous, but uh, we still see that kind of ambiguity quite a bit in Greek. The important thing is to be thinking about um, how clear your placement of the genitive uh, is. And when you're reading uh, Greek literature, uh, when you're reading the New Testament, you'll find that by and large, uh, this rule of thumb works, but that there are some cases in which uh, you have to search around to find uh, a, uh, a lead nominal for a genitive phrase that makes sense. Sometimes the writers will just rely on the fact that uh, if we take the uh, genitive with anything else in the sentence, um, the sentence reads nonsense. But for the most part, this rule of thumb will be helpful. You can learn more about Greek cases and the genitive case in particular in Mounts's Basics of Biblical Greek. Just remember that Mounts introduces the genitive case together with the dative case, which we'll be looking at later. For now, just focus on what he says about the genitive and its forms.